1994, an aspiring game designer dreamed up of a cinematic adventure that would forever change the gaming industry. Two years later, his vision became a reality with Tomb Raider, a third-person action-adventure game that immersed players in a world of ancient tombs and mythical realms, challenging players to solve puzzles and navigate deadly traps. Yet the game's true breakthrough was its female protagonist, Lara Croft, who shattered stereotypes and won the hearts of gamers worldwide with her intelligence, fearlessness, and sheer tenacity. Tomb Raider was a phenomenon, but success came at a price. The original team faced tremendous pressure to churn out yearly releases, leading to exhaustion and burnout. Despite massive royalty checks, the creators of Tomb Raider eventually had to step away from the franchise they had brought to life in 1997. A new team was assembled, hoping to keep Laura at the forefront of gaming, but their efforts fell short and the franchise's once mighty reputation crumbled. In a desperate bid to salvage its image, Eidos made a drastic decision one that would forever alter the legacy of Tomb Raider. Join us on a journey of triumphs and tragedies, of daring dreams and harsh realities, as we explore the fascinating history of how Core Design built and lost a legend. Core Design was founded in 1988 in Derby, England, by a team of 25 individuals who are housed in an old Victorian mansion who specialize in creating games for the home computer platforms, such as the Commodore 64, Atari ST, and DOS. The early success came with a game titled Rick Dangerous, which was heavily influenced by Indiana Jones. The team received further success with Chuck Rock and AH3 Thunderstrike, leading them to be the first British studio to receive a license to develop games for the new Sega Genesis console. At this point, Centrigold then acquired Core, and during this period, Jeremy Heath Smith, one of the founders of Core, hired Toby Gard to assist with the development of their first Genesis game, PC Racers, in 1994. As the next console generation loomed, Jeremy Heath Smith was one of the first to be invited out to the States to get a first look at Sony's PlayStation. He flew back to England to tell the team about what they needed to do and held an off-site meeting to discuss ideas for a 3D game. Toby Gard pitched the idea of raiding mysterious tombs deep under pyramids with a third-person perspective, an unprecedented concept at the time. Everybody loved the idea of what mysteries can be found under the tombs of a pyramid, Heath Smith said in an interview in Eurogamer. Guard's daring vision represented uncharted territory, but he was able to persuade Smith to greenlight the project. Programmer Paul Douglas and seasoned level designer Heather Gibson were recruited. Although she initially struggled to comprehend the concept, Guard was able to assist her by providing a 3DS Max render. It was a beautifully rendered Egyptian tomb with light shafts and dust clouds, Gibson remembers. I know where he's going with this now. Now I get it. Newcomers to the industry Gavin Rumery and Neil Boyd joined the team. And for the final member, programmer Jason Gosling was added to round out the original team of six responsible for creating Tomb Raider. Gard and Douglas have been working non-stop for the past six months alone, mostly on the design of Lara and pre-production. The inclusion of the rest of the team was a welcome addition. However, this did not alleviate the grueling and difficult working conditions that the team was about to experience during the next six months of development. According to Rumory, Core Design Studio had an almost mystical quality, with some describing it as a mansion due to its size and Victorian-style architecture that had been converted into offices. Each team was stuck working in tiny rooms that couldn't accommodate more than six people. Nathan McCree notes that they didn't have any design documents or real planning, but instead, everyone just chucked stuff into the game as fast as they could, and somehow we all made it work. The team drew inspiration from various sources, including Ultima Underworld, a 3D first-person RPG, Toby Gard explains that they aimed to create a game that looked as visually exciting as a cartoon, while offering the same freedom of movement as Underworld. We conceived the idea of taking a corridor-style game and introducing a main character, moving away from the first-person feel, Gard told Primus. The second major influence was Virtual Fighter, which featured 3D characters that impressed Gard with their smooth movements. I saw Virtual Fighter on the Sega Saturn, and I remember going, wow, that's amazing. We can actually have 3D characters. The concept for Tomb Raider was to combine these elements to create a game that felt like a film, with the camera following the character in action, as Gard explains. It's kind of like watching a cartoon, but you're inside of it. That was the whole concept behind Tomb Raider. The team at Core Design had a clear goal in mind, to create something that would stand out from the glut of Doom clones flooding the market at the time. We didn't think about looking at repeating something that had already been done, so we had never considered needing other games for reference, recalls Heather Gibson, the PC gamer. There was one game that the team drew immense inspiration from, the 1989 platformer Prince of Persia. Prince of Persia's animation and how it was tile-based was definitely an influence, 
The doppelganger was a homage to the shadow boss in Prince of Persia, shared Paul Douglas in a 2020 Twitter Q&A. Everything about Lara's movements from her short jumps, long jumps, crouching and sprinting were identical to those of the prince. Even the dangers Lara faced in her exploration mirrored those of the prince, such as spikes, collapsible platforms, and metal teeth snapping traps. However, creating Lara's world was not without its challenges and sacrifices. The development of Tomb Raider proved to be a daunting task for the new programmers Rumery, Gosling, and Douglas, as they had to create new features that had never existed before. The animation system, AI, and camera system, basically all the things that make Tomb Raider third person rather than a first person Doom clone, they told Primus. Douglas had to develop a brand new 3D engine, specifically for Tomb Raider, as none of the other engines from Core were able to handle the game's requirements. The team had even more difficulties when attempting to create the 3D environment and make Lara interact with it. Heather was attempting to build them directly in 3D Studio, which could only edit in wireframe mode, but neither Paul or I had a clue how we could get a character to interact with freeform environments, given the processing constraints of the day. This challenge would be overcome when Gavin Rumery created everything on a grid. To me, this is the point when Tomb Raider became feasible, and everything seemed to fall into place. Toby was able to define Lara's moves, Paul could get the controls working, and I was able to build a level editor that Neil Boyd and Heather could use to build and test the environments far quickly than would have been possible using 3D Studio. In 1996, Eidos Interactive acquired Centragold and proposed a significant change to the direction of Tomb Raider, replacing the protagonist with a male American character. Toby Gard, the creator of Lara, strongly opposed this idea, as he had envisioned a strong female lead at a time when muscular male characters dominated the industry. Gard's unwavering commitment to his vision proved to be a defining moment for the franchise, Initially, Guard's first draft of the female lead was a muscular South American Tomb Raider named Lara Cruz, who had undergone military training and was inspired by tank girl Nene Cherry in John Woo's film Hard Boiled. Guard was motivated to create a female protagonist after observing that men enjoyed playing as female characters in games. As Guard recalls, When I was watching everybody play Virtual Fighter, I found that a majority of the guys were playing as the one female character more than all the guy characters. That was interesting to me. Eidos rejected Gar's proposal for Lara Cruz, and after much discussion, they agreed to a more British-friendly name. To further differentiate his vision from other games, Gard made his protagonist Lara Croft as English as possible, with American villains. So I made her as English as I possibly could, you know, like super English, and then made a lot of the baddies American, just to do the opposite of what everyone else was doing. Not because I hate Americans, understand, but just because I wanted something unique. Gard's drawing served as the basis for Lara's in-game model giving her a comic book appearance. Although Gard intended to break away from the stereotypical male lead by creating a confident, intelligent female protagonist, her body ended up being the most attention-grabbing feature. This was due to the need for Lara's model to use minimal polygons for optimal performance, which, when combined with Gard's exaggerated character sketches, resulted in Lara's distinctive figure. Paul Douglas, one of the game's programmers, recollected during an AMA session that Laura's iconic triangular breasts were intentional, as two triangles either side and two quadrilaterals on the front were about as efficient as it can be done. Gavin Rumery remembers it differently. Toby was obviously trying to make her sexy, because that was meant to be part of her character. He always claims he slipped on the mouse and made the breast bigger than he meant to, but how true that is, I don't know. But Gard himself did acknowledge that Laura's appearance was intended to be attractive, stating, she was meant to just be curvy and attractive. If you're gonna be following behind her, she might as well be appealing to look at. And it worked for both men and women on that basis, because women liked that they were playing as a female character in the first place. Toby Gard's dedication to Lara Croft went beyond just making her a sexy female character. He spent countless hours perfecting her animations, an area he believed was lacking in other games at the time. I was very keen to get Lara to animate properly, which no one else at the time was doing. This made her move slowly, but look realistic which helped players empathize with her, Gard recalled. He chose to animate Lara by hand rather than using motion capture, as he believed it gave them more direct control over each animation and directly influenced how the game played. Gard even went so far as to add hidden Easter eggs to the game without telling his colleagues, including Lara's iconic handstand move. He would go that bit further to add something else in there rather than just say, that's fine, then move on to the next animation, said Neil Boyd. With the development team steadily bringing their vision to life, they had plenty of time to meet their 1996 Christmas deadline. However, they were soon to be hit with a huge curveball. Jeremy He Smith called a meeting to discuss the progress of the game, but instead of easing the team's burden, he put additional pressure on them. Heath Smith had struck a deal with Sega to release Tomb Raider on the Saturn console before the PC and PS1, without informing the team. This meant the game had to be completed six weeks earlier than anticipated, and developed simultaneously for all three platforms. 
The team refused, but Heathsmith persisted, stating, It's a really good deal. I really need it to happen. The already tight deadline was slashed by one and a half months, leaving the team with no structure or organization to cope with the chaos. They sacrificed their personal lives and worked tirelessly day and night to fix the bugs and update CDs. That's how we ran the business at the time, relying on the developer's sheer grit to get the job done, stated Heath Smith. The pressure was so intense that team members slept under their desk or even in a cupboard. Many people were sleeping under their desk or in their chair. Even in a cupboard. I found somebody asleep in a cupboard once, McCree remembers fondly. As the deadline drew near and the team grew weary, they recognized the need for additional assistance. They enlisted the help of their colleagues at Core to aid in tasks such as developing enemy characters and sound effects. Among these colleagues was Nathan McCree, the esteemed composer renowned for the iconic music of the Tomb Raider series. The team tasked McCree with composing the entire score for the game in just three weeks. Despite the cramped studio space proving to be a hindrance, it may have actually spurred the music's success. McCree utilized only synthesizers for the game's music, and there was no time for revisions, so all the music was used exactly as originally composed. McCree even based the music on Lara Croft herself, making it more personal and impactful. Gar told me a lot about the character of Lara Croft. She was a beautiful English girl, classy and intelligent. He wanted the music to reflect that. We quickly decided that English classical music would be a good fit. I needed to add a sense of beauty into the music, and usually in life, the simplest things are the most beautiful. So Nathan McCree opted for a simple four-note motif that would appear repeatedly throughout the game. He even added his own breathing at certain sections to create a more realistic choir sound. Due to time constraints and lack of planning, McCree composed all the music without knowing where it would be placed, resulting in the creation of location-specific music. This unique approach allowed the developers to convey specific emotions and sensations in different areas of the game, giving Tomb Raider a more suspenseful and eerie atmosphere. Despite the additional help from fellow core developers, the team was still unable to incorporate everything they had initially planned. According to Game Informer, the team behind Tomb Raider faced numerous technical limitations that prevented them from realizing the game's full potential. As Toby Gard explains, we couldn't have any outside sections. That was the main technical restriction with the original Tomb Raider, so the ideas we had for bigger open-ended areas we had to leave out. In addition to these limitations, the team had planned to incorporate several key features, including a diary that doubled as a map and note-taking tool, a torch for illuminating dark areas, and dynamite for combat and uncovering hidden secrets. However, time constraints prevented them from fully implementing these features, or refining the game's gunplay mechanics. Another major challenge the team faced was Lara's Braid. As Paul Douglas explains, Lara's Braid was removed as its movements and collision with Lara herself never worked as well as we liked. We just didn't have the time to fix it as there was so much else to do. Despite extensive development discoveries, Tomb Raider remained largely unknown in the gaming community for much of 1996. Everything changed when Gavin Rumery was able to get Tomb Raider running smoothly on a brand new NVIDIA graphics card. We've had 3DFX come around with one of their graphics cards, and I got Tomb Raider working on it, he says. So it was suddenly this thing that ran super slickly, amazing, and looked great. The team would send that demo to E3, and the rest would become history. After that, all the magazines wanted to talk to us, Rumery recalls. Suddenly, we were the hot thing. Tomb Raider was the breakout hit of the 1996 Electronics Entertainment Expo. With attendees and media alike impressed by the game's potential to revolutionize the gaming industry. Despite the demo not being completely polished, hundreds of people flocked to the demo booth to see Laura Croft in action. IDOS, recognizing the game's potential, heavily marketed at the prestigious ECTS event in London just months later to overcome their $2.6 million deficit. But Toby Gard's vision of an intelligent, powerful woman was completely dismantled by IDOS's marketing team who capitalized on the laddish culture of the time. Eidos brought three Lara Croft models to ECTS, all dressed in her iconic tank top and shorts with dual pistols. And this portrayal became more lewd and sleazy as Lara was put in provocative clothing and poses on billboards, magazines, and ads worldwide soon after. This was a shocking revelation for the team back at CORE, as I never even thought about Lara being the selling point for the game. They recognized Lara was going to be this huge thing, more so than we did, said Rumory. They could see that Lara was this big deal, and it was worth focusing on her. Eidos marketing did not sit well with Gard, who was unhappy with the direction Eidos took with the character. He felt that Lara was this unattainable, austere, dangerous sort of person, and that his original vision was more sophisticated than what Eidos portrayed. He even created his own movie-style posters for marketing, which Eidos swiftly rejected. 
According to Ian Livingston, a marketer for IDOS at the time, there was nothing wrong with the focus on Laura's sexuality. You look back at it and you might think it was too much focus on her sexuality of Laura Croft, but we were living in the times of lad magazines. Everyone was a part of that culture. IDOS's marketing strategy paid off when Tomb Raider was released in November of 1996, becoming an instant success. Much to the surprise of the core team though, who had worked tirelessly in isolation for the past year. Despite the game's massive popularity, the developers received little public recognition for their hard work, while IDOS flew magazine editors to Egypt to celebrate the launch. The developers were left behind, working on translations so the game could be released worldwide. We saw all these pictures of these journalists having a jolly good time in the desert by the pyramids, Rumi remembers. And we all sat there thinking, you bastards, we didn't get any of that. Although IDOS capitalized on Laura's sex appeal to hype the game, the unprecedented graphics and gameplay kept gamers hooked. With Laura as their guide, players journey to previously undiscovered lands inspired by the Inca, classical Greece, and ancient Egypt, exploring forgotten tombs in isolated territories. While Laura focused more on puzzle solving than battling enemies, players were still fully engaged with the game's unique approach to gameplay. In its first year, Tomb Raider sold 2.5 million copies, earning recognition as the second best action game of the year and the second best adventure game of the year behind Super Mario 64. It also won the award for best animation at the 1996 Spotlight Awards and was praised by video game magazines for its advanced graphics, captivating environments, and strategic use of combat to build tension. Next Generation even held it as a thrilling, thought-provoking adventure on par with Hollywood's greatest hits, making it a landmark title and potential trendsetter for the gaming generation. Lara Croft brought significant financial success to IDOS, turning a $2.6 million deficit into a $14.5 million profit in just one year. She also helped to raise the profile of Core and had a significant impact on solidifying the PlayStation as the console to own. This success came at a significant price. Toby Gard was disheartened by how Eidos was portraying Lara Croft in a lewd and insensitive manner, leading him to make the difficult decision to leave Core just a few months after the release of Tomb Raider 1. Gard explained, I had issues when they started dressing her in revealing outfits, and sometimes taking her clothing off entirely. It's strange seeing a character you created being portrayed in such a way. I spent my life drawing pictures of things. And they're mine, you know? Gard was determined to leave Core and even tried to persuade two of his colleagues, Gavin Rumery and Paul Douglas, to join him. With the success of Tomb Raider, Gard was presented with numerous new opportunities, most of which came from studios in America. Despite this, Gard did not immediately jump to another studio and instead stayed at Core to figure out his next move. With a sequel in the works, Gard and Douglas refused to assist the team. Rumory remembers, he didn't believe there should be a sequel because it was supposed to be a one-off game. I was in a room with him for three months and all he did was complain. During this period, the trio was supposed to be working on Gard's new idea, but according to Rumory, he kept it under wraps because he didn't want Jeremy to steal his next big idea. The poisonous atmosphere ultimately got to Rumory, who decided to return to the team. I realized nothing was happening. Toby was incredibly frustrated and the environment was toxic, Rumory explained. So I decided to work on Tomb Raider 2 instead. I don't even think I told Jeremy I had switched teams. Jeremy Heath Smith tried to prevent Garden Douglas from leaving Core Design when he realized they were about to depart. He even went as far as to say, I'm now your dad, okay? Now, as your father, I'm telling you this is simply the worst mistake you'll ever make. Just stay for the next 12 months, don't do anything, don't even work on the game. He argued that the unique royalty-based contract offered by Core would set them up for life. But the caveat was that they would only receive bonuses while working at the company. They would get nothing if they left. Although the team stood to earn much more in royalties over the next year, Guard was determined to leave. Losing control of Lara was the deciding factor, and money was not a priority. Guard and Douglas left Core Design in 1997 to create their own studio, Confounding Factor, where they could have more control over marketing, PR decisions, and creative freedom. With the departure of two key members, the team dwindled to just four. They collected their sizable royalty checks and focus on the highly anticipated sequel, Tomb Raider 2. IDOS gave the remaining four of the Tomb Raider team only eight months to complete the sequel. With Gard and Douglas leaving, reinforcements were needed. To fill Douglas's position, Andrew Howe joined as a programmer, and two animators, Stuart Atkinson and Josh Charme, created the new core team. They upgraded Rumory's engine setup to ensure that Tomb Raider 2 would be bigger and better. For one, Core has overhauled the graphics engine, to prevent clipping problems and render a large number of polygons on screen. This allows for large exterior areas, dynamic lighting, and atmospheric effects, such as breaking glass, said Mike Schmidt, the game's associate producer in the States. 
The team's focus shifted towards getting Lara into larger, more open spaces. The worlds won't feel as toomey as the first, said Schmidt. Venice is an example. Half of it's inside, half is outside. The sunken ship and Great Wall worlds have significantly larger external areas. And to mix things up further, the game will force players to go back and forth between internal and external environments. With larger and more open levels, vehicles were the next natural progression. The team added two for the next installment, a motorboat and a snowmobile. Introducing vehicles was my idea. I'm quite proud of that, said Atkinson. Lara now had access to an arsenal of deadly weapons, including a shotgun, dual automatic pistols, dual Uzis, an M16 rifle, grenade launcher, and even a harpoon gun for underwater battles. But the biggest change from the original game came in the form of combat. The team introduced the challenge of having Lara fight and defeat human enemies, a bold departure from the original game, and a move that Toby Guard opposed in TR1 development. They created a diverse range of adversaries for players and Lara to take on, attempting to push the game's excitement and intensity to new heights. The team also upgraded the AI of enemies to make each encounter more realistic for the players. Andre Thompson, one of TR2's producers, explained, Tomb Raider 2's artificial intelligence is being retooled to accommodate each world's human crew. In the last game, you could jump up on a block and pick stuff off. The intelligence of the enemies should be a lot better now. Now they climb up after you. If Tomb Raider 2 was going to be a success, the team knew that just improving the gameplay wasn't enough. Lara Croft, the iconic protagonist, had to be even more captivating than before. To achieve this, the team increased the number of polygons in her character model, making her look more realistic, as Thompson explains. We've added polygons to Lara to smooth out rough edges and also added some more facial features. The new Lara Croft has about twice as many polygons as the original character. In addition to these technical upgrades, the team also gave Lara new outfits and abilities that improved her gameplay. She could now walk through shallow water, light dark areas with flames, climb ladders, turn 180 degrees while jumping or swimming, and use zip lines in certain areas. Gavin Rumery, a member of the team, was especially pleased to have finally fixed an error from the first game. I was pleased to get Lara's ponytail working, he said. It had been dropped from the original because it just didn't work properly with all the acrobatic moves. It was more like she had an electric eel attached to her head that had a life of its own. The team poured their hearts and souls into creating an unparalleled gaming experience for Tomb Raider 2. However, the cost of their dedication was their own sanity, as the grueling demands of development surpassed even those of the first game. We would sleep under the desk for an hour and then wake up again and make a coffee, Neil Boyd says. You'd splash yourself with water. When you work seven days a week, you don't even get a day off to do your washing. The team efforts took a heavy toll on their personal lives as well. I felt like I was working 24 seven and I did it for months, says Rumery. I thought of nothing else. I didn't sleep properly. God, it was horrible. Neil Boyd even went through a divorce as his wife felt neglected due to his relentless work schedule. She sat me down and said, Neil, I haven't seen you for the past two years. Are you seeing another woman? I said, God, I wish I had time. Despite the hardships, the team was driven by the promise of royalty checks if they got the game right. To be honest, the royalties kept us going, admits Rumery. The team's dedication paid off in the end, as the new game saw significant improvements during the crunch period. Rumery recalled, Things like Winston the butler and the whole last level where she goes back to the mansion and you have a final shootout were all added in the last month of the game. We popped those things in just for the fun of it. With the team reaching their limits, there was a bit of luck that spared them even more stress. The Sega Saturn version of the game was dropped, and IDOS signed an exclusivity deal with Sony in the middle of development, limiting the game to just the PlayStation and PC. Despite the team's sole focus on two versions and the addition of extra help, including six playtesters who repeatedly played through the game to detect bugs, there were still some game-defining elements that could not be added to Tomb Raider 2. These included crawling through narrow spaces, swinging on ropes, and performing a hand-over-hand -hand gymnastics move. Ideas for more vehicles for Lara, such as a motorbike and a horse, were also cut due to time restraints. As E3 approached, excitement for Tomb Raider 2 grew, and Eidos kept the same marketing approach as previous years, ensuring that Lara was the star of the show. In 1997, Eidos named Rona Mitra as their first official Lara model, and fans were delighted. According to IGN, a huge contingent of show attendees stood by the booth for long stretches of time, just to get a look at some model in a green tank top, black shorts, and sunglasses. After E3, IDOS continued their ambitious marketing campaign to the rest of the world, launching a multi-million dollar campaign that included radio commercials, print and television ads, and a partnership with MTV and Pepsi. Lara even made special guest appearances on huge video walls during U2's ongoing Pop Mart concert tour. Paul Baldwin, vice president of marketing for IDOS Interactive said, While Lara had a huge cult following, we're taking steps to maximize every opportunity to capture the 7 million installed base of PlayStation gamers, as well as the increased number of PC users. We believe Tomb Raider is the hottest franchise in electronic gaming, and we're allocating a multi-million dollar marketing campaign 
to ensure that the arrival of Tomb Raider 2 is a major event for both consumers and retailers. When Tomb Raider 2 was released in November of 1997, it proved to be an enormous success. Players eagerly embarked on Lara's quest to uncover the mystical dagger of Xi'an, taking them on a journey across the globe from China to the heights of Tibet and the cities of Italy. The development team's decision to shift the focus to combat resulted in the game selling faster than its predecessor and moving over 8 million copies worldwide. Critics and gamers alike were enamored with the game's vast array of features, from the new vehicles and traps to the ability to climb walls and explore enormous levels. GameSpot praised the game's level design, describing Lara as a modern Alice in Wonderland, while IGN raved about the new puzzles and traps. Puzzles are less obvious this time, and require some definite backtracking and exploration to figure out. The game was not without its faults, as many found it to be quite difficult, IGN warned. Be prepared to spend a lot of time with this girl, it's not a walk in the park. While IDOS celebrated the game's success, the development team had reached their breaking point. Six frustrated and disheartened members made the bold decision to resign from Core, after discovering that IDOS would not grant them two years they needed to develop Tomb Raider 3. Neil Boyd explained, Six of us went into Jeremy's office, and we all handed our notice in at the same time. He was shocked, but he understood where we were coming from. Fortunately, Smith didn't want his team to leave, and was able to make a counteroffer that allowed them to stay at Core and develop a new game with a better royalty rate as each member was set to earn over six figures from Tomb Raider 2. Boyd further explained, We would help nurture a new team on Tomb Raider 3, and we would be allowed to do a game that we wanted to do for core design, with a better royalty rate. We thought, it's a no-risk situation, and we get to work on our own game, so we stayed. They offered us more money than the royalties. I thought, wow, this is more like it. Eidos's money-hungry decision-making caused frustration for the team. Gavin Rumery suggested an idea that would allow a new core team to work on a part two to Tomb Raider 2 while they rested for Tomb Raider 3, but IDOS would not allow it. Rumory expressed, but suddenly that was announced as Tomb Raider 3, which we found out by accident via a press release in a magazine. We were pissed off about that. We confronted Jeremy about it, but realized we were burnt out on Tomb Raider. Ideas hadn't been flowing well for what we were gonna do with Tomb Raider 3, so we decided to back off. The Tomb Raider franchise was about to face its biggest challenge yet, as the original members of the team decided to move on to a new adventure, Project Eden. The end of an era had come, and a new team was brought in to continue the legacy. However, they were unaware of the daunting obstacles that lay ahead of them. The stage was set for a new chapter in the Tomb Raider saga, and it was uncertain whether the fresh team was about to carry the torch and keep Lara Croft shining in the spotlight. Don't you think you're soon enough? In December of 1997, the newly formed Tomb Raider team faced the daunting challenge of completing the highly anticipated Tomb Raider 3 in just 8 months, the same as their predecessors had done. While Nathan McCree was the only remaining original member, and Andy Sandham had prior experience with the franchise, most of the team had limited exposure to Tomb Raider. Peter Connolly, who worked on the sound effects, recalled, My first real experience with the series was playing Tomb Raider 2 during Christmas. What I remember most about this was wishing I was working on such a game. Nine months later, I was working at Core Design. Despite this, the team was eager to make Tomb Raider 3 feel like a true sequel. The team revamped both the game engine and level designer. Tomb Raider 3 moved away from the 8-bit palettes and lower resolutions of its predecessors, instead embracing 16 palettes and high resolutions. With the new engine providing greater speed and capacity for detail, the team also upgraded every aspect of the game, including the water elements, which were now transparent, reflective, and rippled realistically as Laura swam through them. The team introduced a new underwater explosion effect and made empty shells sink to the bottom. They also added multicolored lighting and effects such as mist, smoke, snow, wind, and rain to enhance the atmosphere and realism of each level. Finally, the team improved the fire and explosions to be more realistic and engaging. Through the revamping of the level editor, the new Tomb Raider team was able to abandon the old grid system and adopted the use of triangles. This change allowed the Tomb Raider 3 team to achieve an unprecedented level of detail with realistic organic surfaces and incorporate architectural structures such as domes, arches, and vaulted ceilings. The Tomb Raider 3 team explained in a GameSpot interview that the majority of the levels are triangles. Basically, the levels look more real now. We also implemented a vast number of effects such as fish in the sea, realistic fire, rain, snow, realistic splashes, and flocks of bats. All the textures used in the levels were originally drawn in true color and then converted down to be used on the PlayStation and PC, resulting in a better overall result. Tomb Raider 3 also departed from its traditional linear level design and opted for a more player-driven experience. Once players finished the initial section of the game, they could choose which of the next three chapters to tackle next, allowing for greater player agency. Additionally, each of the 20 levels offered at least two routes, with the easier one being less complex and allowing for players to save at any time. 
while the more challenging route offered more rewards but required careful use of safe crystals. Mike Schmidt, IDOS's associate producer, explained, We plan on awarding the players differently, depending on which route they take. However, the players won't know which is the tough path, so they'll be inclined to do a lot of backtracking to see what they missed. For this adventure, the team chose to move Lara away from her Tomb Raiding roots, and instead placed her in more modern settings, such as India, London, and Nevada, offering players new and diverse environments. Adrian Smith explained, The locations are quite diverse. London features a nighttime rooftop level. From there, Lara drops into some of the buildings, including an eerie waxworks museum and the Natural History Museum. Eventually, she finds her way to St. Paul's, and from there into the sewers, deserted tube stations, and Masonic halls. Creating these levels was no easy task, as it took the team between three to five months each. Andy Sanham described their work ethic saying, We all just hammered it. We were all competitive in making levels. We were working until three in the morning. We'd come in at about 10 a.m. and then just hammer the hell out of it. The Tomb Raider 3 team recognized the need to improve not just the atmosphere and level design, but also the enemy AI behavior. To accomplish this, they brought on board Dr. Tom Scutt, an AI PhD holder, to elevate the AI to a new level. According to Mike Schmidt, associate producer, if you start firing into a group of tigers, they will most likely retreat back into the level and try and regroup and attack later. Moreover, the enemies will work together to block Lara's progress. It may even lead her into a trap. Adrian Smith, operations director, also added, many of the enemies will work together in groups to cut Lara off, so she'll have to work out ways to distract them in order to proceed. The team also expanded the types of enemies, including cannibals, tribesmen, a T-Rex, vultures, SWAT team, scientists, and mutants. The puzzles in Tomb Raider 3 also got an upgrade, moving beyond the traditional key door puzzles to involve creative solutions. As Schmidt said to IGN, Lara might have to find a way to swim through a pool of piranhas, using something in the area, or find a friend who has a map to cross a rocky pool or swamp. The new approach to AI behavior combined with the expanded variety of enemies and improved puzzles was the team's way to try and make Tomb Raider 3 a much more engaging and challenging experience than its predecessors. But the team wasn't done there. They also introduced a plethora of new moves for Lara to combat against the game's new threats, allowing her to do things she never could before. Adrian Smith elaborated, The duck ability lets Lara quickly avoid gunfire and shoot while in the duck position, making her combat more strategic. The hand-over-hand -hand monkey swing can be used to move over areas that Lara is unable to cross on foot, and the new dash ability allows her to sprint to safety when she needs to make a swift escape. The inclusion of the duck ability also paved the way for the team to introduce a new gameplay style for players, stealth. According to Mike Schmidt, Lara's new crawl works great for hiding or crawling behind walls while trying to stay out of the line of sight of a patrolling guard. I think Tomb Raider fans will really love this new strategy element. The team drew inspiration from GoldenEye, one of the top games of the time at stealth, but they made sure not to drastically change the core of the Tomb Raider gameplay. In addition to her new abilities, Lara is also getting an upgrade in her arsenal. She'll have a wider selection of outfits, weapons, and vehicles at her disposal. Her weapon options now include an automatic rifle, rocket launcher, and Desert Eagle guns. As for transportation, she can now utilize a kayak, a James Bond-style underwater propulsion vehicle, and a quad bike. As E3 approached, IDOS went all out on its marketing campaign for Tomb Raider 3. They had chosen Neil McAndrew, an English model, as the new Lara Croft, and sent her on a press tour around the world. McAndrew made stops in Spain, Germany, the US, and Australia and also appeared on various TV and radio shows. Her image graced the covers of several UK gaming magazines, and she even appeared in a music video for the German band Die Arze. During E3, Core Design set up a virtual Lara to engage with fans by answering their questions. Two operators controlled her movements on a PC, while a third listened for questions, and they had Lara's voice actor ready to respond. The event was a hit with the fans, adding to the excitement and buzz around the game's release. In total, IDOS spent a whopping 1.7 million pounds on advertising for the game in 1998. Prior to the release of Tomb Raider 3, IDOS hosted a celebratory event at the Natural History Museum without inviting the game developers. Andy Sanham, a member of the development team, discovered the event after it had already happened and joked, Perhaps they realized if we'd gone to that, we would have accidentally wrecked it in some way or another, as we tended to do whenever we were brought out to the public. Sanham continued, I thought they could have at least chosen the right museum though, as the level in the game was actually based on the British Museum. Despite selling 6.5 million copies and becoming the second highest grossing game in Europe after its release in November of 1998, Tomb Raider 3 failed to surpass its predecessors. While it received generally positive reviews for its improved graphics, smarter AI, and non-linear gameplay, it was criticized for being excessively challenging and too similar to previous games. Douglas Perry, a reviewer for IGN, stated, Tomb Raider 3 isn't a black and white affair. It's not brilliant. Those who were getting tired of the annual revision won't like this any better. 
In fact, they can easily claim that Tomb Raider is the same as ever. Tomb Raider 3 plays identically to its predecessors, and it's packed with the same flaws. From trapping you in areas with no escape, to frustrating Indiana Jones style boulder tricks, to huge expanses with nothing to discover. And while there is more action, it's just awkward, clunky, and jump heavy as before. Unfortunately, Tomb Raider 3 fails to solve any of the original dilemmas, and as it stands, the exploration adventure genre, one that was revolutionized by Tomb Raider, is in the same position it was two years ago. After successfully completing one Tomb Raider game, the new team was granted a second opportunity when Tomb Raider 4 was given the green light for release in 1999. Taking into account the feedback received from both critics and players regarding Tomb Raider 3's difficulty and confusing gameplay, the team behind the franchise aimed to revolutionize the series with Tomb Raider Last Revelation. The team's main objective was to bring back the classic feel of the original game and make it easier to follow. As Core's operation director Adrian Smith stated, the philosophy behind Last Revelation is much more akin to the original title, in terms of its puzzles, mechanics, ancient locations, and atmosphere. In some ways, Last Revelation is a prequel to the trilogy, but the technical advances will make it far more detailed and atmospheric. To achieve this, the team focused on Egypt and its mysterious tombs as the central plot and location of the game. Smith explained, Egypt as a location offers tremendous scope for atmospheric locations, mythological artifacts, tombs, and baddies. We've really been able to go to town with some weird and wonderful enemies. When it came to crafting a clear and concise story, the development team devoted significant effort to creating a streamlined narrative that would be easily understandable for players throughout the game. We're really focusing on a storyline that's driven seamlessly through the game, so instead of loading screens, the game will dissolve into cuts and FMVs. Since loading screens are eliminated, we're looking at a really continuous single adventure that will really keep the players focused, said Smith in an interview with GameSpot. This new approach to using seamless cuts and FMVs was spearheaded by Andy Sanham, who took over as a scriptwriter for the series after Vicky Arnold departed. When Vicky, the screenwriter for Tomb Raider 3, left the project, there was a gap to fill, and I took the opportunity to write a movie-style Tomb Raider game, explained Sanham. All of these changes were made with the goal of revitalizing the series for both new and old players. Our intention has always been to make the fourth game as accessible as possible to everyone, whether they are longtime fans or new players, Smith emphasized. We're focused on simpler gameplay so the game will be easier than TR3 in terms of direction and objectives. The difficulty lies in solving the puzzles that will enable players to complete objectives. Despite having a clear vision for the game, the development team realized that the fourth installment of the series was beginning to show its age. In order to modernize the game, they decided to revamp the interface and inventory system, giving it a fresh and updated feel. The introduction of Lara's Diary was also a new addition to Revelations, as Adrian Smith explained. As soon as you load the game, you'll be presented with a completely new interface. Gone are the inventory, rings, passport, etc. We're introducing a brand new inventory system where items can be collected and combined. Additionally, Lara's Diary will keep a log of information, maps, and other items she collects throughout her adventure. In previous games, Lara had lost touch with her Tomb Raiding roots. So in Revelations, the developers placed a significant emphasis on correcting this issue by creating some of the best puzzles the series had ever seen. We have pressure pads, time levers, rotating hubs, wheels, hanging switches, switches and holes, platforms and blocks that can be raised, trip wires and breakable walls. The old levers from previous games are now obsolete. We have a whole range of new systems for Lara to operate, using a variety of new animations," elaborated Smith. In Revelations, as with previous games, Lara's character received upgrades in both polygon count and movement abilities. This time around, she was depicted with even greater detail and gained new abilities, such as a hand-over-hand -hand shimmy that allowed her to navigate around corners. Additionally, she can now use her hands to open doors, shoulder barge them, or even kick them down. But perhaps the most significant addition was Lara's newfound ability to use ropes, which became an essential tool for solving puzzles within the game. She could climb up and down them, grab and swing from them, adding a new dimension to gameplay. Moreover, in the opening minutes of the game, players were given a unique opportunity to delve into Lara's past through a training level. This level shed light on Lara's backstory, which had been notably absent from previous installments of the series. In a historic move, Tomb Raider received its first dedicated PC version, free from the constraints of the PSX engine. While the PC format remained identical, the enhanced graphics and added bump mapping created a more detailed and realistic experience. With Sony's exclusivity deal now expired, Lara also made her way to the Dreamcast, and the development team worked tirelessly to ensure that the game was detailed and immersive on all platforms. To achieve this goal, the environments were populated with 3D objects, and the lighting was improved to create a more realistic atmosphere. The aiming system underwent an overhaul, eliminating the auto-lock feature that spoiled the surprise for players. These changes contributed to a more challenging and rewarding gameplay experience, regardless of the platform used. Eidos and their marketing team spearheaded a massive 5 million pound promotional campaign to generate hype for Last Revelation. 
spanning across print, television, and online platforms. Lara's face adorns six billboards across major cities, further increasing the game's visibility. To make Lara more accessible to fans, Eidos introduced a range of collectible items, including trading cards, candy bars, and even a monthly comic book. At E3, attendees were greeted with a yearly Lara model, who was presented with a motorbike to add an extra level of excitement to the event that year. The last revelation released in November of 1999. It sold over 5 million copies globally, the lowest of any release so far. Despite attempts to return Lara to her roots, the game received mixed reviews with criticism aimed at its subpar controls and technical difficulties. The game failed to revolutionize the series as intended, leading many to feel that it was far too similar to previous titles. Andy Sanham, the lead writer, tried to kill off Laura at the end of the game anyway, a decision that wasn't surprising, given the team's challenging working conditions. Richard Morton, lead level designer, revealed that the team worked long hours, sometimes until 4am. We just said, look, let's just kill her. Somebody went, well, how are we going to get away with that? We were like, let's just do it and see what happens. So we did it. Sanham remembers. Looking at Lara's avatar all day every day for two years was about as much as some of us could take. Management was pretty hands off, so for two weeks we hatched this plan to kill Lara, and followed it through to fruition. Indeed, the game ends with Lara entombed under a collapsed pyramid entrance, a dramatic and perhaps poetic end for the adventurer. The decision was obviously met with disapproval from Core Design CEO Jeremy Heath Smith. He said, what the hell have you done? We were like, well, we were getting really sick of her. He said, well, you need to fix it. So obviously with Tomb Raider 5, even though she got an entire pyramid on top of her, she somehow managed to crawl up underneath it. Sanham originally thought about decapitating Lara, but ultimately decided against it, saying, We knew Jeremy would probably decapitate us. Although the new Tomb Raider team enjoyed creating their games, money was a significant incentive for them to join the team in the first place, despite being aware of how the original team was treated. We got a massive royalty check at the end of it, and then we went, right, let's do this again. It was basically a situation where we didn't mind if we died, as long as we got the royalty check at the end of the game. It's an enormous motivator, explained Annie Sanham. After the release of Tomb Raider 3, some of the team members earned over 300,000 pounds, causing tension within core design. Towards Tomb Raider 4, people used to think we were jerks because we knew we were the golden boys. People didn't know about the royalty checks, but they knew we were required for the day-to-day -day running of IDOS. The team thought that Tomb Raider 4 would be their last game with Lara, but IDOS was not going to let their lucrative icon die at the hands of their development team. The team was required to correct their decision and revive Lara Croft with a filler game until the true next-gen game, Angel of Darkness, was complete. At this stage, the team was mentally exhausted and lacked the enthusiasm to carry on. Tomb Raider 5 was effectively a load of old stuff. That was the most depressing one for us. We were effectively just doing that for a paycheck because no other team wanted to take it on, Sandham recalled. As Laura was presumed dead at the end of Last Revelation, the team saw an opportunity to experiment with the game's structure. Instead of a linear narrative, they opted for an episodic format. Three of Lara's friends and associates would reminisce about some of Lara's earlier adventures, with each story representing a different gameplay style for Lara. Rome was focused on classic tomb raiding platforming, Russia emphasized action and stealth, Ireland provided another chance to play as a young Lara, and the fourth area showcased new mechanics introduced in Chronicles, such as Lara's new AI companion. Adrian Smith elaborated on this new feature, stating that, It's a very high-tech level, and this time Lara has a companion called Zip. Zip is there to guide her, give her information, and help her through the levels. And again, it draws on using elements of stealth and the new AI. After four years, the game engine had reached its peak, which meant that Chronicles did not feature significant upgrades in that area. But players were able to witness Lara execute some new moves that were absent from Last Revelation. There's a tightrope walk so Lara can actually negotiate her way across a tightrope. We put in some parallel bar swinging so she can use parallel bars now. We put in a lot more interactions with the environment. She has new weapons, she has a grappling hook so she can throw the hook into the scenery and then grab the rope and scale it, Adrian Smith explained to GameSpot. But the most significant addition for PC players was the level editor. Tomb Raider producer Mike Schmidt stated that, Since this is the final Tomb Raider installment to employ the existing technology, Core thought it would be fantastic to offer the room editor to the public. Many PC users had desired this feature in the past, but it was never developed with public use in mind. Eidos went all out with a massive marketing push for Chronicles, seizing upon two opportunities. The first being the mystery surrounding Lara's supposed demise, and the second, the impending release of the Tomb Raider movie starring Angelina Jolie in 2001. This campaign included 15 and 30 second TV commercials showing Lara trapped under an avalanche, which aired on popular channels such as MTV, ESPN, Comedy Central, and TNT. Fans could also visit TombRaiderMovie.com to watch live webcasts from the movie set and view the first movie trailer starring Angelina Jolie as Lara Croft. Additionally, Timex released a new watch featuring Lara's image as part of the merchandise campaign. 
Paul Baldwin, Vice President of Marketing at IDOS Interactive, commented on the importance of keeping the franchise fresh. As the Tomb Raider series matures, it's imperative that we continue devising new and different forms of merchandise to keep surprising Lara's faithful fans. Along with the Timex Watch partnership, the continuing curiosity about the Tomb Raider movie will build momentum for the new game. Despite Eidos' significant investment in marketing and positioning Chronicles as the epic conclusion to Lara's journey on the PS1, the game's lack of innovation and development failed to impress both players and critics alike. While it received some praise for its graphics and reasonably engaging storyline, the game's unchanged gameplay mechanics and poor controls drew heavy criticism, indicating the franchise's exhaustion. Consequently, Chronicles received mixed reviews and became the lowest selling game in the Tomb Raider franchise, selling only 1.5 million copies. After paying off their debt, the team behind Chronicles was no longer bound to IDOS, and only designer Richard Morton stayed with Core to join forces with a new group working on Angel of Darkness, who had moved into a new state-of-the-art office courtesy of IDOS. With a year of development already under their belt, Morton was optimistic about joining a team that had made significant progress. Upon arrival, he was shocked to discover that the project was in a state of utter chaos. The new team had made very little headway, and had already scrapped the entire project once with only the basic story concept in place. With the project in danger of collapse, Eidos made the decision to recruit virtually everyone from Core to help salvage Angel of Darkness, including getting back Gavin Rumery, who joined the team six months later when the studio was at its lowest point, after his previous game Project Eden failed to impress. Upon his arrival, he found a team of over 40 developers struggling with significant issues, including the PlayStation 2's hardware. Unable to get anything running smoothly, the team had to scrap the entire engine once and start over from scratch. The step up to the PlayStation 2 and the complexity was not properly envisioned by anyone at Core at the time, James Kenny, a concept artist, remembers. Because they've got a PS2 dev kit, the concept was effectively Lara visits every major city in the world that's built in GTA style, recalls Sanham, who left Core in 2001 after Chronicles. When we looked at it, we were like, that can't possibly work. We need to immediately go in and cut 90% of that content out, otherwise, you're screwed. But IDOS aimed to include every modern gaming element to compete with other popular games at the time like the Metal Gear series. They envisioned an open world gameplay style with RPG elements, stealth and hand-to-hand -hand combat, and a new character Curtis Trent, for creating a spin-off series on. Despite Jeremy Heesmith's proposal to remake Tomb Raider 1 for the PS2, IDOS rejected the idea, instead focusing on creating four new next generation Tomb Raider games in the future. Smith did regret his decision to give in to the pressure from IDOS. I should have stuck to my guns. They just wanted more. They wanted bigger. They wanted interaction. They wanted Lara to talk to people. They wanted decision making. Just stuff that was happening in gaming at the time. So we shoehorned that into Angel of Darkness. The concept behind Angel of Darkness though, was to showcase a darker, more intense portrayal of Lara, who was falsely accused of murdering her mentor Von Croy. In a bid to clear her name, she embarks on a journey that takes her from Paris to Prague, ultimately cultivating in a thrilling finale set in the underground cities of Cappadocia, Turkey. But due to several missed deadlines by the development team, Eidos demanded that substantial amounts of content be removed from the game. I told Eidos the game wasn't finished. They didn't want to know. It was a case of, well, we're going with it, whatever. We'll figure it out later. The game was rapidly brought to a halt and literally shoved onto a CD. It needed another six to eight weeks to have finished properly, but we didn't have that because we were chasing the share price, Heath Smith recalled. And the team was ruthless in cutting content, from dialogue to character animations to sound bites. They even scrapped two levels, one of which was supposed to be the game's finale, while the other level that was cut was a World War II castle. And according to Rumory, the Paris level, for example, was meant to be free form. You were meant to be able to explore and chat to people, but none of the dialogue elements had even been worked into the game. The cuts were so extensive that even the explanation of how Lara survived the pyramid collapsing on her in Last Revelation was removed. But the most significant reductions were made to Curtis Trent's character, who, by the end of development, was a mere shadow of his intended self. Writer Murdy Schofield recalled, He ended up as such a thin, emasculated version of the character we planned in the early stages of development that I could have wept. He was a casualty of war in every way. The whole process was one slash and patch, right up to the last possible moments before release. On top of the troubles of developing the game on the PS2, Angel of Darkness posed a significant challenge for Core due to the lack of proper management and organization. Core had historically worked with smaller teams, but the scope of the project necessitated a larger workforce that proved too difficult to manage. According to Rumory, it didn't have any organization to it. It wasn't clear who was in charge or who the leads were. The lack of clarity led to a series of disasters as the team realized that things were not adding up. Rumory recalls trying to address the issue with the lead programmer, only to be passed through a chain of six people before realizing that everyone was waiting on someone else. 
The problem was also compounded by the absence of Heath Smith at the time, who was overseeing new development projects for IDOS during the Angel of Darkness development. Rumory noted that he was away quite a bit of the time from the actual company, suggesting that Smith may have taken his eye off the ball with Tomb Raider The Angel of Darkness. IDOS spared no expense on the marketing campaign for Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness, investing 6 million euros in television, cinema, print, outdoor, and online advertising. Collaborations with companies such as Creative Labs and Jeep were formed to promote the game, while a partnership with Paramount Pictures was forged to take advantage of the upcoming release of the second Tomb Raider movie. Despite the marketing hype, the game failed to meet expectations, with mixed to unfavorable reviews due to various issues, including poor controls, camera, stealth, and combat systems. The story was also found to be polarizing, with players and critics alike finding it difficult to follow. IGN's Douglas Perry concluded that the game fails in nearly all of the gameplay areas. The only redeeming quality was the sound design and music. Angel of Darkness sold just 2.5 million units and became the second worst selling Tomb Raider game of all time. IDOS had succeeded where Core fell short. They successfully killed off Lara Croft. Faced with a barrage of unfavorable press, IDOS made the bold decision to remove Tomb Raider from Core and entrust it to their more dependable American studio, Crystal Dynamics, in an effort to salvage the situation. Despite the fact that IDOS had worked Core relentlessly for the past seven years, the decision didn't go down well with them. They just took it and ran, recalls Rumory. It felt like a robbery. Honestly, it felt like we've been raided ourselves and the thing had been stolen from us, he told Ars Technica. It felt like we've made one mistake. It was such a shock that we weren't going to get a chance to do anything about it. We turned out these six massive games that had made them so much money for IDOS and kept IDOS afloat. And the moment that we had the slightest slip up, we were shot through the head effectively. Core believed that IDOS had two primary motives for abandoning them. The first being their founder, Jeremy Heath Smith. There was a what went wrong board meeting in which I was held accountable, which was fine, Jeremy Heath Smith explains, to which I said, well, it wasn't finished. So therefore, be it on my shoulders. I said, I'm happy to resign. They said, no, we don't need you to resign. IDOS put Heath Smith on gardening leave two weeks later. All of our egos are high and I was like, well, screw you, I'm out of here anyway. I'm gonna start my own development company and I'm gonna take everybody out of core. I was fairly arrogant at the time because that was the world I spent the last seven years in. So off I went and they paid me handsomely to go. It was all good. Half of the team would stay with core and the others joined Heath Smith and created Circle Studio. The second factor was core themselves and how Heath Smith allowed them to operate. We were seen as a kind of cowboy renegade outfit whereas the American studios like Epic Electronic Arts Crystal Dynamics were the new model of professional, continues Sanham. Whereas we were still the sort of cowboys that were messing around with creativity, trying things out. There had been various deadlines that had been missed, Andy Sanham says. At that point, they were looking for an excuse to ditch us. Ida's board members kept requesting the release date. Jeremy kept sending back faxes that said, when it's ready, which was driving them mental. They were getting really angry and they wanted an excuse to get him off the board. For IDOS, it came down to the fact that Core just couldn't get the technology for the PS2 to work. They were fantastic at developing on the PS1, but just didn't quite make it on the PS2. In the meantime, we knew Crystal had this incredible physics engine they've been using for Legacy of Kane, and they could quite easily create an intense puzzle-solving game, which would be the next Tomb Raider, explained Ian Livingston, the president of IDOS. We gave it every chance. They had the best part of three years to get it right, and it didn't happen. Pressure from shareholders, pressures from consumers. We had to make the tough call. But for Heath Smith himself, the decision was always inevitable. It was always going to happen, Heath Smith laments. I even recommended they take it away from Core and give us a rest. Let somebody else have a go at it, and then we'll do something else on it and we'll be working in the background. For me, it was let Crystal do the next one for the next two years, and we'll do one in four years' time. Following the loss of Tomb Raider, Core began designing PSP games for IDOS to keep their studio afloat. After two long years, the studio would attempt one last dance with Lara Croft. After Heath Smith left Core, Gavin Rumory stepped up as a studio manager in 2004. He fought to keep Core at IDOS by persuading them to allow Core to make PSP games. Two years would pass before Core began developing a game called Free Running, inspired by the successful remaster of Capcom's Resident Evil in 2002. Rumory believed he had the perfect idea to save Core, remastering the original Tomb Raider game for its upcoming 10-year anniversary. He went on to pitch the idea to IDOS, but they were uninterested. However, Fate intervened when IDOS was acquired by another British games manufacturer, Psy Entertainment. Rumory in turn pitched his idea to the new owners, who were very enthusiastic about the idea and gave the go-ahead for Rumory's team to begin development. With Core Design back to creating a Tomb Raider game, everything was going smoothly, so off we went and started really going for it. The guys on it were really into it. It was meant to be a celebration for the original Tomb Raider. We were really going for it with the graphics, Rumory told Eurogamer. The game was developing nicely and it was playing great, but there was one issue. Crystal Dynamics didn't want Core back in the picture so they attempted to steal the idea and create their own demo for the anniversary edition, and 
it worked. We were making the Tomb Raider remake, and then suddenly they put forward their own demo. It was a basic demo, using a bit of beginning of the opening scene of Legends running on PSP. I didn't think it was a big deal. I thought, come on, look how much we've got. We've nearly finished on this. I didn't foresee it as a particularly serious threat, and it didn't seem to make a lot of sense because they were going to have to outsource it, rumor recalls. But they convinced whatever the politics at Psy were, that it made more sense to just keep it in one studio, says Rumory. Keep the franchise in one place, and so ours was killed. And you've never heard of it if it hadn't been leaked by somebody. Crystal Dynamics will go on and release their anniversary edition in 2007, missing the 10 year anniversary of Tomb Raider by one year. And they didn't even hit the 10th anniversary, so they had to call it just anniversary. It came out on the 11th anniversary. The only bit I proposed that came to fruition was the idea of doing it in the bloody first place. It was gutting. Rumory sadly remembers. Core never overcame the setback and struggled to stay afloat for a few more years, working on projects that received terrible reviews such as Shellshock 2 and after being sold to Rebellion Development in 2006, Rogue Warrior. Gavin Rumory and what was left of the remaining core team shortly left after. It felt like trying to pilot a plane with its wings on fire or something, Rumory said. The best I could do was stop us crashing into the ground. Rebellion's existence was short-lived, lasting only until 2010, ultimately leading to the demise of one of the world's most prosperous and longest-running video game studios the world had ever seen. Despite the unfortunate shutdown of core design, the legacy of Lara Croft continues to endure, captivating gamers and inspiring countless others. She has transcended the medium of video games to become a cultural icon, a symbol of strength, tenacity, and unwavering determination. The fact that her character endures to this day, two decades after her creation, is a testament to the skill and creativity of the designers at Core. As we look back on the impact that Core Design had on the gaming industry, we could take solace in the knowledge that the spirit of Lara Croft lives on, inspiring us to be brave, adventurous, and fearless in the face of adversity. Lara Croft is more than just a video game character. She is a legend, and legends never truly die. <laughs>